So we've been working with, uh, we've mostly been working with uh, unit generators that are oscillators, noise generators, and filters. We've been focusing mostly on synthesis in our sound design work so far in this class. So I would like to spend all of today talking about using sound files, basically doing creative work that involves sampling instead of synthesis. It's sort of two sides of the, of the same coin. A lot of uh, music that we generate, is, it's rooted in one or both of these two things. So we're going to focus on sampling. And working with samples in Super Collider is uh, pretty much a two-step process. The first step is we load some audio file on our computer uh, into a buffer which lives on the Super Collider audio server. And then step two is we use unit generators which are designed to read data from buffers. And a buffer is basically a block of memory in which data can be stored so that it can be retrieved later. And in this case, we're just talking about storing the individual audio samples that make up an audio file and then basically playing them back uh, in the future, maybe at the same, uh, sort of in the same order, maybe at the same rate, maybe not. Right? We can play it back in all, all sorts of different ways. So I'm gonna, we're going to use the first half of class to talk about getting buffers into Super Collider and all of the sort of detail work. And then hopefully the second half will we'll deal with um, some unit generators. Primarily, we're going to deal with uh, PlayBuff. There's basically two, um, two unit generators, two which I consider to be the primary UGENs, which read buffers. There's PlayBuff, and there's also Buff Read. But uh, there are two, two things, two UGENs that basically have the same purpose, but they're designed a little bit differently. And I think PlayBuff makes a little bit more sense as the UGEN to introduce. But first, we have to get some sound into some buffers. So I'm going to do this uh, in several different ways. I'm going to boot the server first. Uh, I just used a hotkey, so we're just going to type this here just so we're consistent. Uh, I'm going to do it in kind of the messiest, easiest way first, just kind of using kind of bad, so semi-bad programming practice here. And we're just going to make a global variable called b. And we're going to say buffer.read. And uh, buffer.read takes two arguments. One is the server, the name of the audio server on which we want to load this file, followed by a string representing an absolute path to the file on our computer. So the server is s, lowercase s, like it is the same thing we're booting, is the same server that we want to load the audio onto. And then we need an absolute path to a sound file on my desktop. I have a folder called audio, and in uh, audio I have uh, three subfolders, flute, glitch, and voice. And so the flute, these are two extended techniques with flute, the tongue ram, and a sort of flute slap tongue technique. Uh, glitch, these are sound files that I created by recording the output of a calibration tone generator, but like messing with the knob in funny ways, so they're kind of glitchy sounds. All right, just crunchy, crunchy little things. And then this is me talking. I just ripped some audio from one of my Super Collider tutorials, which I've, I've used in other tutorials, just me talking. It just completely broke my brain. I had no idea what I was hearing or that sounds like this could exist. So we just have some audio files to work with. So let's, let's just take the... Um, Take the voice, and uh, you know, basically, we want we want the absolute path to this file. So that is, uh, I mean, you know, we can look it up. I, I don't even really know where to find it, frankly. You know, we're talking about like you go to your hard drive, and you know, all the, the sort of path, folder by folder by folder, making your way in, and that is uh, one of the most annoying things to have to type manually. We we never do it. We don't have to. There's a couple of things we can do. We can uh, copy and paste, and it uh, automatically makes the file for us. Another thing we can do is just simply drag and drop. So both of those techniques work really well. And once the server is booted and you have your complete buffer.read statement, you can just shift enter on that line. And the quickest way to make sure that something uh, loaded and you know you got the path correct and everything is to just play the buffer like this, b.play. It just completely broke my brain. I had and I'm going to command period on that, just not to listen to the whole thing. Uh, okay, so uh, once we've got, I mean, the, once we've got a buffer in, we can 
get a bunch of pieces of information about it if we want. And the summary is b.query, and this posts some basic information. Every buffer that gets loaded onto the server is automatically assigned an integer buff num, which is basically the identifying number. Each, each buff num is unique. The number of frames, which roughly correlates to the number of samples. Uh, um, and then uh, the number of audio channels. So this is a monophonic buffer, just one channel. And it was recorded at a sampling rate of 48,000 samples per second. Um, just a quick clarification on frames. The number of samples in a buffer equals the number of frames times the number of channels. Now, I might have messed that up. Yeah, no, the samples is equal to frames times channels. So you can think of frames as like uh, a single slice of all of the channels, just one sample on all channels. And then a, a channel is a horizontal slice, right? So it's kind of like a checkerboard. If it's a stereo file, you have two channels, same number of uh, samples in each channel. So uh, if you know we have a one second buffer, that's uh, 48,000 frames, but there's two channels, so there's 96,000 samples. This is a subtle difference, but for the most part, we can we can treat frames as being roughly equivalent to samples. Okay, so this is this is um, uh, the the quick and easy way to load a buffer. I mean, B is not a particularly good name. If we continue with this with this convention, we're going to run out of letters. You know, B, C, D. You know, so it's better to use meaningful names, something like this, perhaps. Uh, and there's some other problems associated with this this way of working as well because it's an absolute path. So if we ever were to um, move this this file somewhere else on our computer, then its path would change and this string would no longer be accurate. For, just for example, uh, we can, we'll go ahead and free this buffer. So this, the free method deallocates that buffer and the, the sound is no longer available. We can no longer play it. Uh, and if I were to take this and just kind of dump it on the desktop, oops, then uh, uh, this doesn't work. It says no, no such file or directory. So these absolute paths are kind of inconvenient to work with. Um, so there, there are better ways to do this. And uh, it's a little bit more work, but it's much more robust to do it in the way I'm about to show you. And the first step is uh, following the same sort of paradigm that DAWs follow, where you have your session file and all of your audio files and resources are stored in that same folder. So wherever the project folder goes, the audio files come with it. So that's the first thing we're going to do. I'm going to save this as uh, lecture code and the date. Um, and I'm going to make a new folder on the desktop called the same thing. Right, and I'm going to save this SuperCollider code file here. And then I'm going to take this audio subfolder and put it in there as well. So now we have our code file and our folder of subfolders of audio files. So they're now basically, we're just going to make sure this folder stays as one unbroken unit. Wherever this folder goes, the code and audio files go with it. Right. And so now um, we can use a special, a special keyword in SuperCollider, uh, which is this process, and then the method now executing path. Uh, the, the technical details of what this process actually refers to are, are not particularly relevant here and not particularly easy to explain. Um, but this particular expression returns a string representing the absolute path to this code file, the code file called lecture code 2021-09-23. And so it lives at users, Eli, desktop, lecture code, et cetera. Now, if I were to take this folder and you know, send it to one of you and you open it on your computer, wherever it happens to be, then this expression is going to return the absolute path to that file, this file, on your computer. So when this folder moves, this uh, expression dynamically adapts. It, it always tells you the current location of this file. And we can use this to our advantage with a little bit of uh, folder hierarchy navigation. So there's a little bit more. What we want to get, basically, 
is we want to move up one level. So we're not looking at the, um, the code file itself, but the folder in which it lives. And then we want to tack on the name of the folder containing the audio files, which is audio, right? So uh, we can do that by using a class called pathname. Pathname is a class which allows us to uh, represent and talk to and navigate through files and folders on our computer. And we simply give it the string, right? This, this, um, by the way, this, this thing in the post window is actually a string, right? So a, it treats this as a, uh, an ordered sequence of characters enclosed in, you know, like this is also a string, right? So this process that now executing path is a string and we can put it in path name. So once we have an instance of path name, it doesn't look much different, but we can say something like uh, parent path. And this gives us a string to the parent path, the folder in which it is enclosed. And we could do this again. And then we go, uh, actually, that doesn't work. I think we have to enclose this in a path name again. I'm going to do something like this. Right, and then we go up another level. But we don't really need to go up that many levels. Now we have a string representing the path to the parent folder. And from here, we can say, uh, add the word audio to it, right? And so now we have this, and then we'll want to go in and say, uh, I think it's just voice, is that right? Voice, yeah, and then voice.asf. So we could, uh, we could stop here and then we'll, we'll say, we'll call this path, or we'll call this like a audio path. So now we have a, a thing called audio path, which is a string to the audio folder. So now we can be a little bit more robust. <coughs> say audio path plus the rest of the, um, put a slash here, plus the rest of the, um, the path. So we say voice slash voice.aiff. So just to recap here, we have a string representing the path to the current code file. It has to be has to actually be saved, right? This the only time this won't work is if you're in a completely new file that hasn't yet been saved as a file. This has no meaning because this is we're just working, sort of, uh, you know, not not with a we haven't actually created a file on our hard drive. But once you've saved it somewhere, then this is the path, the absolute path to the current file. This expression gives us a string to the parent folder. Uh, then we can uh, append some additional characters to make it represent the path to the audio file folder. And then we can use that audio path and attach additional characters to represent individual sound files. So we could also do, um, you know, flute uh, slap, and this would be Whatever this is called, I think it's a flute slash flute underscore slap. Right. So now we have two of these files. It just, right. just kidding command period on that. Right. The advantage here is that we never need to change this code. This code is now pretty much set in stone. And as long as we keep this uh, structure intact and don't change any of the names or locations of the files, it will work um, no matter where this folder is on anyone's computer. You know, you can move it around on your own computer. Um, so that uh, in the in the homework and at times throughout the semester, I will refer to the um, the approach using this process that now executing path, and this is what I'm referring to. It's a way of ensuring that your file paths are always correct. Even this can be improved upon uh, with, with a little bit more work. We can basically use iteration uh, on the parent path of audio files and then basically read in the files from each subfolder. But instead of using class time to do that, what I think I might do is, is send a separate code file with instructions so you can uh, uh, it's just uh, it's it's um, 
it's even more helpful because then you don't even have to worry about specifying the names. The, the code will automatically go into each folder and iterate to see if there are subfolders and then go in and, and just read those, take the absolute paths and read them in and it will structure them in a, in a nice way. And you might find that if you have, um, you know, 100 buffers or 100 sound files you're working with, it's really tedious to give each one an individual name. So in some cases, you might actually want to just load these into an array or some other type of collection so that you can refer to them more simply. Like, for example, um, you might want to just make one array called B and then store all of these in that array so you can just access the items using numerical uh, indices. And that would look something like this. Uh, no, sorry, B is an array, so square brackets. And then uh, go here and here, right? And actually, let me, uh, oh, I, I, you know, I'm going to do one of these here. Just free all the buffers and load them again. Um, if you, if I repeatedly run this code, like this, what I'm doing is I'm I'm uh, I'm not deallocating the previous buffers, that, you know, the, the, but I'm just sort of uh, overwriting the variable that contains the array that holds the buffers, and allocating two more buffers, two more buffers, two more buffers, and eventually Super Collider will complain. It says I don't I'm not allowed to allocate any more buffers, so it's um, this is some a little bit of a detail to keep in mind. If if you if you're just kind of sketching out some ideas and loading buffers and just dynamically trying things, you might, you know, eventually Super Collider might say no more buffers available. So buffer.freeall is, is, the, is the way to basically just clear the slate, deallocate all buffers, and start again from scratch. Okay. So now we have an array, and we can say b at 0.play, b at 1.play. It just completely... And you can put you know, add more, more files in here, as many as you like. I guess that the main downside of using an array is that th we're back to sort of the beginning problem where this is not a, this doesn't really tell us which sound file it is and we kind of have to keep in mind. So there are um, alternatives to this as well. There are other types of collections which are unordered, but you refer to um, objects by a symbolic name. And you know what, I think I can quickly show one of those as well, instead of using a buffer, we can use a class called an event, which is, uh, I think, which just looks like this. Let's see if this works. Yeah. So it's a slightly different syntax. Instead of the square brackets, we use the parentheses. And then we use a, a name with a colon immediately after it. We can't do a space here. It's not going to work. The colon turns this into a symbol type class. Uh, and then so in this event, the item associated with the name voice is this, this uh, buffer here. And the item associated with flute slap is this buffer. So now we can say be at backslash voice. It just completely and be backslash flute slap. So this is the event approach. This is the array approach. Event is it's another type of collection, just like array, except instead of in a specific order with numbers, it's uh, it, technically unordered, but you can refer to each item by a unique name. Right, I think the most important thing to take away here is this process that now executing path and using this special keyword to guarantee file path accuracy. In fact, in in the homework, I'm gonna. This is basically one of the one of the parts of the assignment is I want you to put your code and your audio files in one folder, and then start writing your code using this approach to load buffers. And then for your submission, you're going to actually zip that folder as a zip file and submit that. So I should be able to unzip and your code should just work on my computer if you use this approach. All right, so we're going to move move on. There's, I mean, there's really so much to talk about with just loading buffers in. Buffer.read is just one approach, but I want to move on and talk about unit generators. So we're going to build a synth def for ourselves. We're going to call this um, play. 
And we're going to start like we usually do. We're going to have some signal that uses play buff to read a buffer. And uh, similar to the, the first part of this lecture, I'm going to do this in the stupid way first. And we're going to say, OK, uh, let, we want to play you know, this one, for example. Right? So be at voice. Uh, I can query some information. It's a one channel buffer, so we're going to say one. And we'll just drop this. Uh, the arguments here, the first one is the, the number of channels. This is a mono one channel buffer. Then the buff num. So uh, if we want to be very explicit, we can say be at voice dot buff num, and that's going to give us the, this buffer's buff num. It's also fine to just omit buff num and supply the buffer object itself, and SuperCollider knows what to do. Uh, and we have a couple of other arguments, but I'm going to ignore them for now. trying to keep things as simple as possible. We have a variable. It's called sig. It's a play buff, which is a one channel buffer player that plays this buffer. And out it goes to our speakers. It just completely broke my brain. I had no idea what I was hearing or that sounds like this could exist. Yeah. OK, right, simple enough. So let's, let's unpack some of these arguments um, uh, uh, of play buff and also improve this synth dev. Right now, uh, this synth dev can't really do very much. It has no, there are no arguments that have been declared, so we have no sort of flexibility. We cannot specify an alternate sound when we create a corresponding synth. So we're going to add a few arguments. The first one is going to be, um, the actual buffer to play. Because we, you know, synth depths are, are abstract recipes for making sound. And if we hard code a specific buffer instance into the synth depth, it's like a, a cookbook with only one recipe in it. That's the only recipe you can make. So instead, we want to give ourselves an argument to be able to specify a buffer um, later on. <coughs> so, uh, now we can say uh, buff uh, be at voice. Uh -huh. You can also say be at speak slap. It just. What we can't do is use an argument to control the number of channels. Like if we wanted to read a stereo buffer instead of a mono buffer, this doesn't work. This is one of, the, one of these things that is not allowed in Super Collider. When you define a synth def, the number of channels, of every, the, the size of every UGen has to be known in advance. You can't dynamically change the number of channels in a file. So uh, it's, a, it's a design choice. Uh, it's, um, so this has to be a, a, a hard-coded number. And if you want to uh, make a synth depth that plays stereo files, the thing to do is make a separate. It seems really redundant. You know, usually this is the kind of thing uh, where you say, OK, this is annoying. I have to make an entirely separate synth depth for mono and stereo files. I mean, there are clumsy workarounds here. Like you can make a, uh, I mean, it's if you try to play a stereo file with a mono synth theft, it'll give you a warning and you know in some cases you can kind of ignore it but really uh you should you should uh make two different synth thefts here one for one for mono one for stereo uh i'm going to take a moment and put some more files in here just so we have all of them i'm not sure we're going to use them all but i do want to get them in here Let's do GL0 for glitch 0. And I think this is how they are numbered. Hopefully, this will just work. And then let's find out. Do these still work? It just. Okay. Okay, 
Right? Easy as that. Okay, so we've got we've got an argument here, and um, I'm going to keep these separate for now. Uh, what I'm going to I can't remember exactly how many channels. Okay, so these are stereo files, the glitches. Uh, the flute, that's stereo, and that's stereo. Really, only the voice is mono. Right? You might find it easy to just work exclusively with stereo files, exclusively with mono files. If you have a bunch of mono files, just drop them into an audio editor and you know, basically export them as stereo files, and then you only have to make ones and stuff. But uh, let's focus on this uh, flute ram for a second. Okay, see, I'm using the wrong uh, synth dev here. There we go. Okay. Let's take a closer look at play buff here. So we have a few arguments. The number of channels, the buffer to play, an argument called rate. This is basically the speed at which it will play through the file, and it's a ratio. So one means nor normal speed, scare quotes, normal. Uh, 2 is twice as fast, which corresponds to an octave higher. 0.5 is twice as slow, so it corresponds to an octave lower. Uh, 0 makes the pointer not move. It will not actually, so it plays nothing. It's stuck on one sample. And negative numbers will cause it to go backwards. So... <coughs> it is uh, pretty inconvenient if we want to work with semitones and equal temperament to express pitches as ratios. Nobody does that. But there's the MIDI ratio method. Uh, so one, zero dot MIDI ratio means what's the, what's the equivalent ratio for two semitones that are zero semitones apart? And in this case, we're talking about a unison. So the ratio is one to one. It's the same note. Uh, 12 semitones up is uh, a number that is uh, sufficiently close to 2. Uh, and negative 12 gives us the ratio for uh, 12 semitones down, 0.5. And so now we can just do stuff like this. So we can think in terms of semitones. Very convenient. After rate is a, a pair of arguments that sort of work together, trigger and start position. And these take a little bit of unpacking. A trigger, in the context of Super Collider and in the general world of analog synthesis, is uh, a, a basically just an a, a instantaneous moment which involves a transition from a negative to a positive value, or a zero to a positive value. Uh, and so this can be a number, just simply an argument which changes from zero to one, or it can also be some signal, like a sine wave. And every point in that sine wave where the waveform crosses from non-positive to positive counts as a trigger. So if we have a, a sine wave like this, it's an awful, awful sine wave. But that's a trigger, that's a trigger, that's a trigger, that's a trigger. Right? Anything from a non-positive to a non-positive transition counts as a trigger. So really lo lots of signals can be used as triggers. Um, it can be sort of a manual thing or an automatic thing. Uh, so what is, what, when, when playbuff receives a trigger, what does it do? What happens is the playbuff's internal pointer, basically where we are in the file, instantaneously jumps to the start position. And the start position doesn't have to be the beginning. It can be any, any point in the file. And it's specified as a, a value in frames. So let's add some arguments here. Um, all right, and uh, so we're going to say uh, trig s pause. And I'm going to prep prep the code here. So we're going to do we're going to do my voice because that's a long file, and we're going to play that an octave down call it x. And while it's running, we can, we can say x trig1. 
And I'm actually going to have to, this is kind of a stupid way of doing it. But uh, so we'll start playing. I'm going to uh, cause a trigger to occur at the play, at play buff's trigger input right here. And it's, which, you know, by default is zero, but I'm going to set it to one. And that's going to cause playback to jump to the start position, which is the zeroth frame, the beginning of the file. It just completely blew. It just completely, it just, it just completely. And it's, uh, I'm using the wrong synth def again. I should have just made this a stereo file. But if we have, uh, we can, let's just pretend <laughs> that this is a, a stereo file. It's working, but uh, I'm being, I'm being messy here. I just don't feel like going into a waveform editor and, and fixing this at the moment. But if I were, if I were using, um, you know, that a one here, everything would be, would be fine. <coughs> so th this is a, this is ugly having to sort of manually reset the trigger to zero every time I want to trigger it. And so there's a little trick here. Uh, we can make one of these, uh, any argument into a special trigger type argument by prepending a lowercase t and an underscore. Now what this does is it changes the behavior of this argument. Normal arguments, but while some synth is running and we set the argument value to be uh, something, something new like... Uh, like this. It just completely broke my brain. I had no... Right? We, it's, we set the argument to some new value as the sound is playing, and it stays there. It just stays at that new value that we have set until we change it again. Uh, and that was what was happening with trig. We set it to 1, and it stays at 1. And if we want to re-trigger it, we can't just run this line again because it's already at a value of one, and that doesn't count as a trigger because it's, a, it's already positive and it's staying positive, so we have to manually reset it. When we precede an argument with a T underscore, it becomes a trigger type argument. And in that case, when we set it to a new value, uh, actually, we don't need this anymore. When we set T underscore trig to one, it gets set to one and then immediately snaps back to zero. So it only holds the value for an extremely short amount of time, just one, one control block's worth of samples, like 64 samples or something, something like that. And so it doesn't look like it, but when we set this to 1, it goes to 1 and jumps right back to 0. So we can run this line again and again and again. It just completely broke my brain. I, had I think I forgot to run the synth def, so it didn't update that change. It just completely broke my brain. I oh, you know what else I did? Forgot to update the name here. So name's got to match, right? That's the rule. It just complete. It just. It just. It just. It just completely. It just. Right. And we could do something like, uh, like this. Um, let's see. Uh, v at voice. Dot num frames. So we're making a, we're, you can set multiple parameters at once. Here we're setting the trigger to be one, so we're initiating a trigger. And we're also changing the start position to be a random value between zero and the, actually this should be minus one, right? Because frames start at zero, so the last frame is the number of frames minus one. So it's picking a, picking a random integer between zero, between the beginning and the end. And so every time I trigger it, it's going to jump somewhere random in the file. It just completely I could exist hearing sounds broke my brain had no this could it sounds yeah we can automate this process by uh, uh, by changing the synth up a little bit you could say something like uh, forget about the manual trigger we're gonna make a signal and uh, we could make a control rate impulse generator. This is a, a UGen I don't think we've seen already. Uh, impulse, it's, a, it's an oscillator, but it outputs just very short pulses at some frequency. So we can set this to, I don't know, four. We could make an argument if we wanted to be more flexible. And uh, we can, we just, I think that's, that's all we really need to do. So now when we play this, 
when you sound like this. It's just sort of jumping back to the beginning every time. Uh, you could give it a different start position. So it's basically a nightmare for anyone who doesn't like to hear the sound of their own voice. But I've I've heard the sound of my own voice so many times over the years. I'm just kind of kind of done with it. Uh, all right. So in in this case, we we get kind of a click every time it jumps because it's a discontinuity. We're just making our way through the buffer, and the trigger says, "Nope, go back, back you go, back you go." And so we're just kind of you know make it's basically the equivalent of sloppy audio editing. So I'd like to introduce the idea of envelopes, reintroduce the idea of envelopes in in buffers, and let's uh, let's add an envelope here to control the uh, amplitude. <clears throat> and this is going to be a simple. Uh, let's we'll just make it go. Uh, have a very fast attack and a, a short decay, but not quite as short. And we are accustomed to uh, probably at this point putting a, a done action two here, right? But it's not quite what we want to happen here. If this envelope plays once then, and down action two happens, then the sound is gone. But we want to re-trigger it. We want to re-trigger a jump to the start position and also use that trigger to restart the envelope. So really, neither of these should have done action two, neither the engine nor the play buff. And I believe, correct me if I'm wrong, we've talked a little bit about gates and envelopes and how you can use the gate argument, set it to one, and if it's a sustaining envelope, it will, it will hold itself open until the gate goes back to zero. But in, in this case, where we just have a, a sort of simple two-segment envelope, the gate argument is used to um, basically uh, restart the envelope. So we can plug trig in here. And uh, this needs to be first. Right? You can't do it like this. We have to define trig and then plug it in here. And also plug it in here. So trig is being used for two purposes, to restart the envelope and jump the start position back to the beginning. And uh, there's one more thing we need to do, and that is multiply sig by the envelope. And let's see if this works. Let's slow down the trigger so we can really hear it. It just, it just, it just, yeah. it just, it just, it just, it just, it just, it just, it just. And from here, uh, if we want to change the start position, there's a another unit generator we can use. Uh, you know, we basically want something which takes a trigger and every time a trigger is received, pick a random value. There's a couple of ugens that do this. Uh, I believe T I rand. There's a couple of these. There's T rand, T X rand. The T means trigger. And so T I rand will choose uh, integers, I think. Yeah, random integer value. So you give it a, a, a minimum, a maximum. Uh, let's just, uh, I mean, we, we know that um, this has uh, this many frames. So we can, uh, I mean, it's, we, should, we should, be, uh, should be a little bit more careful here because we have a, a flexible buffer argument. So we could play any buffer. So we'd like to extract the number of frames of that buffer. And we could do that with a eugen called buff frames. So we have a trigger, a little spike, a little sort of little spike signal that happens twice a second. Every time it occurs, spos picks a new random integer from zero to the last frame index of 
buff, whatever that happens to be. We have an envelope that uh, is this short little envelope that restarts every time we get a trigger, and it's being used to scale the amplitude of the signal. And uh, then we have um, our play bus, right? the actual sound source, uh, which is um, stereo, plays this buffer, has a user-controlled rate, and then we have our trig and start positions. So we're basically kind of automating this process which jumps around the buffer and pulls a little envelope from here, pulls a little envelope from here, and just kind of, it's, we're kind of doing like a granular synthesis kind of thing, a little bit, maybe, sort of. All right, we don't need this. This could exist. I, I completely just, or that could exist. Hadn't, or, or that sense. Hadn't, or that this. I had could exist. Exist. Bring. And an improvement I see is, is locking the, um, kind of the duration of the envelope to the frequency of the, uh, of the impulse generator. So this happens twice a second, which means the period is the inverse, right? So there's, there's a half a second between triggers. And so we don't really want this to be any longer than that because then the envelope will not have finished and the trigger will cause a discontinuity and we're gonna actually, we might get an audible click in that case. So uh, we can make an argument here. And then have this be uh, one over imp hertz, and then we'll subtract the attack time from it. So now the, the length of this is going to be exactly, the length of the envelope is going to be exactly the period of the impulse generator, which means we can uh, make, the, uh, make the frequency of the impulse generator you know, even faster. This actually sounds exactly like Paul Lansky's idle chatter. If you have heard that piece, yeah, you can Google it. Paul Lansky idle chatter. It's this exactly, but with like many layers. All right, so th this is just one application of what you can do with uh, with play buff. I've, I've, I came in with a, with a sort of a partial plan, but uh, there were many different branches we could have found ourselves going off onto. And this is one using, using triggers to basically cause the internal play buff pointer to jump around. And it's a pretty easy way to just jumble a sound file. And at this point, we, we can do stuff like iteration, right? If we just uh, have a, an array of, eight uh, random um, playback rates, we'll say minus 12 to zero. It's gonna, uh, oh, sorry, array dot uh, rand. Right, so, and we'll do, we'll do um, floats, right? Random floats between an octave down and no transposition. And we're going to use do, pass in the uh, value here and then we'll grab this and space it out a little bit so it's kind of easy to see what's going on. And the rate is going to be n.midi ratio. Because right? remember, we've got to convert that to a ratio so that play buff knows what to do with it. Uh, and we'll make this a little bit random too. Uh, so that some of the triggers are kind of fast and some of the triggers are, are kind of slow. And yeah, I'm going to go ahead and make one of these. And we're, we're making eight, so I'm going to scale this down just to be safe. All right, uh, fingers crossed. Plenty quiet. I guess we can finally get rid of this error and, and just like say one here, and then we'll add sig and pan. Uh, and we need to put that up here. 
we declare that pan argument and then we can edit down here and say just spread them all the way across the stereo field. <laughs> And now I'm curious what happens if we make this sort of really fast. Yeah, we didn't give ourselves an overall envelope here. We could, you know, add another envelope variable, which is just kind of gives a long fade in and, and a long fade out. And then we could kind of give the overall sound a lifespan. We haven't done that yet, so we're still stuck doing command period to free all this stuff, but it's a pretty small step to go from there. Uh, a couple, let's, I just, um, I do want to point out uh, that the play buff does have a done action to argument of its own. So if we uh, make a very simple sniff def here, I'm just going back many, many steps this. If we just uh, play a sound like this, B, no, uh, buff B at voice. Uh, and we'll open the node tree here. This is a visualization of the synths that are alive and well on the server. It just completely broke my brain. I had no idea what I was hearing or that sounds like this could exist. And that's the end. Uh, the last few arguments here are loop and done action. Loop is either zero or one. If it's zero and we reach the end of the file, we stop. If it's one and we reach the end of the file, in either direction, we wrap back around to the other side and continue going. So sometimes you'll want this to be one, sometimes you want it to be zero. And it's, a, it's an argument that can be uh, modulated. Uh, sorry. This. this is the name of the argument in, in, in playbuff, and this is the name we've given to our synthdef argument. Um, I'm in the habit of giving them the same name, which is fine, but uh, you can call this something else if that's clearer. And I'm going to use a different uh, file here. So. And if I were to do this, that turns off the looping. So the next time it gets to the end, it stops. But we still have this synth kind of hanging around over here. So it's you know if if the if uh, if the act of play buff reaching the end in a non-looping state means the end of the sound conceptually, then you should use done action too. So if loop is one, done action is ignored. Actually, let me start by clearing all the synths off the server. So loop is one, it gets to the end, it just wraps and wraps and wraps, it ignores the done action, doesn't even check the done action. But as soon as loop is zero, then when it gets to the end, it checks the done action. It says, oh, done action two, I'm out of here. So uh, going backwards can be a little tricky, and we essentially want to do this. And then we can say uh, rate negative one. So that works just fine. But if, uh, if loop is off by default, it doesn't work because it starts at the beginning, tries to go backwards, immediately hits the end of the file, checks its done action. Um, so uh, if you want to actually just play a sound backwards once, then uh, I won't demonstrate this, you can sort of figure it out, but basically you'll want to provide a, a start position argument. And down here, set the start position to be the last frame of the buffer. Have loop be zero and done action two. So that way it starts, actually you need to start at the uh, second to last frame of the buffer, because if it starts at the last frame, that's the cue to check the done action. So you want to do number of frames minus two as the start position. Then it goes backwards. When it hits the beginning, that's the same as the end, and it checks the done action. Uh, okay, we're slightly over time, but there's one last thing, I promise, the last thing I wanted to uh, point out. And that is uh, there are situations where 
the server might be running at one sampling rate, but uh, it might be the case that, uh, in this case, they're the same, but you might have a sound file which was recorded at a different sampling rate. Uh, and if that's the case, then you basically have, uh, uh, you have samples on the server occurring at one rate and samples in the buffer being envisioned at a different rate. And so in this case, if you have a buffer and the server at different sampling rates and you say playback rate is one, it's going to line these samples up like this, like this, like this, like this, because the samples need to align with the server's sample clock, but if the buffers are sort of conceived as being more samples or fewer samples, then we get this pitch shift. And so the actual sound, the result is going to have a different pitch from the original sound, even though you're specifying a playback rate of one. And the trick here is to, um, you specify the number of channels, the buffer, and then instead of just putting the, the raw rate, whatever it happens to be, you want to scale this value times a UGen called buff rate scale and supply the name of the buffer. And all this UGen does, buff rate scale, is it produces the necessary ratio of the server's sampling rate to the buffer's sampling rate, and it applies that multiplicatively to the rate in order to compensate for the shift that naturally happens when you have mismatched sample rates. Um, so if we were to just, I, I don't think any of these, let's see if any of these are at um, uh, a different sampling rate, just so I can demonstrate. Uh, yes, this one is not at the right sampling rate. So if I, uh, if we just listen to the regular file and then we try to play it with play buff, Mm. Right? Not the same, even though the rate is 1. So the uh, buff rate scale just to show you what comes out of it. Is this value and 0.91875 is equal to 40, 44,100 divided by 48,000. And that is the appropriate countermeasure which will cause this to be the, uh, the correct rate. Ah. So here we would say, uh, you know, buff rate scale. You know, this is really kind of messy here. Right, so that's the correct version. This is the version that hasn't been compensated. So this is the, the true pitch of the sound file because we've properly scaled the rate. And from here we can say, uh, you know, uh, times two. Right. And that's the actual pitch. Okay, sorry to go a little bit long today. Um, I'll cook up a few questions just to reinforce some buffer practices, not, not too many. And, uh, and feel free to stick around if you have questions, and I'll see you next week.